Welcome. You are about to view a recorded talk from the online seminar series Progress and Visions in the Scientific Study of the Mind-Matter Relation, held in 2018. The seminars aim to bring together researchers from around the globe with a background in mathematics or physics who are interested in the scientific study of consciousness and the mind-matter relation. While each seminar session consists of a talk and a discussion, the latter is not recorded and the following video will only contain the talk. We hope you enjoy it. For further information, please visit mind-matter-relation.org. Okay, well, thank you very much to Robin and Johannes for having me, and thanks for everyone for joining. Uh, so the following talk is based off of a paper that I'm currently writing with uh, my co-author David Chalmers, entitled Consciousness and the Collapse of the Wave Function, and this will be coming out in a, a forthcoming uh, collection entitled Quantum Mechanics and Consciousness. Hopefully this will be coming out in uh, 2020. So just to begin with, here are two of uh, perhaps the hardest, two of the hardest problems arising from contemporary science. The first is, what is the place of consciousness in nature, often known as the mind-body problem? The aspect of this problem that I'm going to be most interested in in this talk is what you might call the consciousness causation problem, which is basically asking, what are the physical effects of consciousness in nature? Or more simply, what does consciousness do? Uh, the second question is, what is the physical reality described by quantum mechanics? And the aspect of this problem that I'll be most focused on in this talk is what's known as the quantum measurement problem. So in textbook formulations of quantum mechanics, measurement seems to play a fundamental role in the theory, but it's rather unclear what measurement is. And that's the measurement problem. Okay, so... Uh, there's a unified solution and, or a solution uh, that attempts to speak to both of those problems that um, has quite a history behind it. Perhaps the most uh, detailed statement of it was given by Eugene Wigner, but earlier statements, uh, so that was in 1961 paper, uh, remarks on the mind-body question. Uh, but uh, you find earlier formulations or earlier statements of the view going back at least to the 1930s in the work of uh, von Neumann and others. Uh, but the idea is sometimes called the consciousness causes collapse hypothesis. So this speaks to the quantum measurement problem by telling us what quantum measurement is. It's an act of consciousness. Measurement is a kind of conscious observation. And it's also supposed to speak to the consciousness causation problem because it gives consciousness a causal role in nature. In particular, consciousness plays a causal role by bringing about the collapse of the wave function. So this is a, a view that isn't very popular in modern physics um, um, for reasons that I'll discuss in more detail in a moment, but the main reason is that it just doesn't look very rigorous. It looks fairly unclear. It's unclear what its predictions are and so forth. And so the purpose of this talk is to argue that this hypothesis can be formulated into a rigorous interpretation of quantum mechanics. Now, I'm not trying to argue that we ought to all believe that this theory is true, um, I'm not sure what the correct interpretation of quantum mechanics is, and in other publications uh, I've shown sympathy with the many worlds interpretation, as has my co-author David Chalmers. However, we do think that uh, this uh, interpretation hasn't really looked into, hasn't been looked into in the kind of detail that it, it deserves. And so what I'm just going to try and argue here is that this interpretation can be made as rigorous as a lot of the other mainstream interpretations of quantum mechanics, at the very least, the other collapse interpretations of quantum mechanics that exist. And so here's the basic structure of the talk split into four sections. Uh, I'm going to start um, by assuming that my audience is not familiar with the measurement problem, so I'm going to uh, go into a bit of detail in explaining what the measurement problem in quantum mechanics is. And then I want to explain a, a general solution to the measurement problem, which we call M-property theory. Um, this is going to be a general template um, that the consciousness causes collapse hypothesis is going to fit into. So after explaining this range of interpretations or this uh, general solution to the measurement problem, M-property theory, I will then explain the consciousness causes collapse hypothesis as a particular instance of an M-property theory. That will be how I'll introduce this hypothesis and try to make it rigorous. And then at the end of the talk, I'll talk about how we can actually 
uh, get some more precise dynamics going for this interpretation. And here I'll also talk about, for example, potential predictions, experimental predictions of the theory. Okay, so to begin with the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. So I'll start by formulating uh, textbook quantum mechanics. And by textbook quantum mechanics, I mean quantum mechanics as it is typically found in the textbooks used to teach quantum mechanics at universities. It's a formulation that um, I guess was made famous, popularized uh, in particular by John von Neumann in his uh, 1930 book, Mathematical Foundations of Quantum Mechanics. Put simply, there appears to be two fundamental laws of nature described in textbook quantum mechanics. One is a deterministic law of nature described by the Schrodinger equation. The other is an indeterministic law of nature described by what's often called the collapse postulate. Now, if these are the two fundamental laws of the theory, then immediately a question arises under what circumstances does a physical system evolve in accordance with the deterministic Schrodinger equation? And under what circumstances does a physical system evolve in accordance with the indeterministic collapse postulate? Uh, it's an important question because a system cannot evolve in accordance with both of those at the same time. That would mean it would be evolving deterministically and non-deterministically in the same time, which is a contradiction. So the question is, under what circumstances does a system evolve in accordance with one law as opposed to the other? And the textbook gives us an answer to this question. It tells us that the Schrodinger equation applies to systems when those systems are not being measured. Meanwhile, the collapse postulate applies to a physical system when those systems are being measured. And hopefully you can see what the measurement problem is. Uh, this notion of measurement is somewhat obscure. What is it doing uh, in the axioms of the theory telling us when one of its fundamental laws applies and the other does not? And so this is basically uh, the measurement problem. So John Bell has a great paper called Against Measurement, where he attacks a lot of these textbook formulations of quantum mechanics. Uh, so he puts it as follows. What exactly qualifies some physical systems to play the role of measurer? Was it the wave function of the world waiting to jump for thousands of million, uh, sorry, was the wave function of the world waiting to jump for thousands of millions of years until a single celled living creature appeared? Or did it have to wait a little longer for some better qualified system, perhaps with a PhD? So here he's just bringing out, it's entirely unclear what it takes to be a measurer, what it takes to be something capable of measurement, thereby bringing out the uh, collapse of the wave function. So that's the measurement problem. Um, and what I wanna do is just show how that comes up in practice with a, a fairly simple example. So, I'm going to explain this example in two ways. On the right hand side, I'm going to explain it with um, some pictures that I've drawn. Um, on the left hand side, I'm going to explain it with a little bit of uh, mathematics. If you're not too familiar or comfortable with the mathematics of quantum mechanics, then you're probably going to be okay just following my drawings. So on the right hand side of the screen, what's represented here is a particle P. Uh, it starts out at position X. It's then uh, moved towards a beam splitter. The beam splitter then puts the particle into a superposition of being located here and being located there, just represented by H and T. And so on the left-hand side, that evolution is represented in Dirac notation with the particle P starting at position X, entering into the superposition of being located here and there. Okay, so if we now introduce a measuring device uh, depicted now at the bottom of the screen, uh, this measuring device is set up so that if it finds the particle located here, then it will display an H on its screen. If it, if it instead finds the particle located there, then it will display a T on the screen. Uh, that's how the uh, measuring device is constructed. At the moment, it's just ready to detect the particle. And so uh, in the mathematics, we've uh, represented that. So we've got on the left-hand side, the superposition. And then on the right-hand side, we've depicted the, de the device D, uh, being ready to perform the measurement. Okay, so if we now um, allow the entire system, the device and the particle, to evolve forward in accordance with the Schrodinger equation, then 
the superposition in the particle gets magnified up into the measuring device. And so the measuring device enters into a superposition of displaying an H on the screen and displaying a T on the screen. Now, I don't know how to draw a superposition of a screen displaying an H and a T. So there I've just overlaid a T on top of an H to represent that. Just, um, okay, but now the measuring device is in a superposition. However, this is supposed to be a measurement. After all, this is a measuring device measuring the position of the particle. So we're not supposed to be using the Schrodinger evolution here. We're supposed to instead be using the collapse law. So assuming this is the point of measurement, we now introduce the collapse law. And so what happens is that the superposition, the wave function, collapses. And so it collapses into um, one of the two possible states. Uh, and here I've depicted the collapse as favoring the H state, the here state. And so I've depicted the particle collapsing here and the device collapsing to representing an H on the screen. Uh, but it could have gone the other way, of course, because this is an indeterministic process. And you can predict the probability that the collapse will favor the H state or the T state uh, using what's called the Born rule. And so the Born rule tells us that uh, the probability of uh, getting the here result is equivalent to the absolute value squared of alpha. Meanwhile, the probability of getting the there result is equivalent to the absolute value squared of beta. Okay, so that's how uh, measurement and measurement-induced collapse comes up in quantum mechanics. And just to give you um, some idea of what's stated in the textbooks and how textbooks talk about this. I've got three quotes from three textbooks. I'm not going to go through um, all of this, uh, but I just want to pick out a few notable remarks. So going back to the 50s, Paul Dirac's textbook, The Principles of Quantum Mechanics, he says, a measurement always causes the system to jump into an eigenstate. Um, so here, measurement is attributed seemingly a fundamental causal power. A measurement always causes the system to jump. The notion of measurement isn't analyzed in any further detail. It looks like it's been taken as a primitive. And so it looks like we've got a fundamental physical process measurement. Um, moving to more modern textbooks, we get the same basic things. So uh, Norazin Detali's textbook, Quantum Mechanics, Concepts and Applications. The act of measurement generally changes the state of the system. The act of measuring uh, observable A changes the state of the system from psi to one of its eigenstates, psi n, of the operator A. Uh, so again, the act of measurement is playing a fundamental role in the theory, doesn't get analyzed um, uh, into anything more precise. Um, um, so again, an illustration of uh, measurement playing this fundamental role. Uh, and I picked Zitali. I could have picked a number of different textbooks here. I picked Zitali just because um, it's the textbook used at my institution, Chapman University, to teach quantum mechanics to students. Uh, finally, I choose David Griffith's statement here. It's a widely used textbook. So the third edition has just come out. The statement of measurement uh, hasn't changed from any of the previous editions. And the problem is stated fairly clearly. Griffith says it was the act of measurement that forced the particle to take a stand. Though how and why it decided on the point C, we dare not ask. Uh, given our example, we could have said the point H. There are then two entirely distinct kinds of processes, ordinary ones in which the wave function evolves in a leisurely fashion under the Schrodinger equation, and measurements in which the wave function, psi, suddenly discontinuously collapses. Among physicists, it, is, it has always been the most widely accepted position. Note, however, that if it is correct, there is something very peculiar about the act of measurement, something that over half a century of debate has done precious little to illuminate. So in this discussion, you actually see uh, some recognition that there's a, a sort of a deep problem here um, that's just going to be sort of passed over. So yeah, if it is correct, there is something very peculiar about the act of, act of measurement. And then you just move on. Um, often you don't get that in textbooks. So there's a tally textbook. It's as if there is no measurement problem. You just talk as if the act of measurement has this fundamental role and you move on. Okay, so um, I'll introduce this phrase, measurement collapse interpretations of quantum mechanics. According to a measurement collapse interpretation, measurement literally causes collapse. Okay, so that's textbook quantum mechanics and the measurement problem. Now I'm going to introduce this general class of solutions to the measurement problem, which we call M-property theory. Now, 
in property theory is an attempt to stay as close to these face value measurement collapse interpretations as possible. So the idea of in property theory is to really take seriously measurement collapse interpretations, but insofar, insofar as there is any imprecise notions, we're just gonna try and make them precise as best we can while sticking to that general form that measurement collapse interpretations take. So that's, that's the basic idea behind what we call in property theory. So if this is the goal, if we're trying to develop a class of interpretations of quantum mechanics that stay in the mold of the face value measurement collapse interpretation of quantum mechanics, then I think this is the first question that we need to ask. What is the basis in which collapse occurs? Or you know, what are the observables that collapse? And I think here we can distinguish two kinds of measurement collapse interpretations. Uh, so we'll call these the variable basis interpretation and the fixed basis interpretation. So the variable basis interpretation looks like, um, looks very much to be the interpretation of the measurement collapse interpretation. It looks to be very much what the textbook formulation is all about because the basis of collapse is, you know, changes all the time. There's not a fixed basis of collapse. So different observables on different occasions collapse. Um, now, the problem um, with the variable basis measurement collapse interpretation is the difficulty in saying what determines which observable is the basis of collapse. Now, um, the textbook formulation tells us, well, that's the one that's being measured. It's the observable that is being measured that collapses. So if you're measuring the position of the particle, then position is the basis of collapse. If you're measuring spin, spin is the basis of collapse and so forth. Still, the question remains, what determines uh, which observable is being measured. Now it looks like that's the choice of the experimenter, but now this is gonna be quite difficult to make precise because now we've got this other rather obscure notion, the free will of the experimenter. Um, now, this is something that Henry Stapp has developed in detail. So Stapp has really tried to uh, give a very face value interpretation of quantum mechanics that stays as close as possible to the measurement collapse interpretations. Um, but when uh, it comes to this issue of saying what is or what determines the observable that's being measured, uh, Stapp introduces a new process called asking a question of nature, but doesn't really analyze it in further detail. Um, so in that respect, I feel like we haven't really resolved the measurement problem because we've still got a phrase or a term that is just as obscure as the notion of measurement. In this case, the free will of the experimenter or the process of asking a question of nature. And so because we want to formulate an interpretation of quantum mechanics that stays in the mold of the measurement collapse interpretations, but removes all the imprecise notions, we're gonna to move to what we call a fixed basis interpretation uh, where it's the same observable that serves as the collapse basis all the time. So the collapse basis is not going to be determined by a measured property, the property that the experimenter chooses to measure, such as the position of the particle or the spin of a particle. Rather, we'll say that the collapse basis is more like a measurement property, a property of measuring devices, and that's going to determine the basis of collapse, and that'll be a fixed basis. The problem then is to try and uh, be precise about what that measurement property is. Um, and eventually we'll have to replace the notion of measurement with some more precise notion. Uh, but insofar as, um, uh, we'll, we'll do that in a moment, but for now we can just speak about M properties uh, in, in place of measurement properties. And so that's gonna be the basis of M property theories. Okay, so in a little bit, more detail. Our strategy. We are trying to take measurement collapse interpretations at face value as much as possible and make precise the imprecise notions. Why do that? Well, this textbook formulation of quantum mechanics is what's used by physicists. It's what's been very successful, at least in uh, practical applications, making predictions, uh, technology, and so forth. It's the successful version of the theory. So, let's see how far we can go by making an interpretation precise that stays as close as possible to that formulation. So that's the basic strategy. And so we wanna make precise the imprecise notions. We've got in textbook quantum mechanics, the notion of a measuring device. How do we make that precise? 
well, we'll replace the notion of a measuring device with a system that possesses an M property. And we haven't said what these M properties are, but they're going to play the role of measurement properties or being a measuring the property of being a measuring device in textbook quantum mechanics. And here's the basic idea. So we're going to uh, say that there's a basic or fundamental law governing these M properties. Roughly, I'll, I'll try and be more precise about this uh, in what follows, but just to start with, here's a rough formulation of the basic law governing M properties. An M property, by law, refuses superposition. When about to enter a superposition, it responds probabilistically via the Born rule with collapse. Okay, so you, you, an alternative way of putting this is to say that there's an operator corresponding to the M property or the M observable. We can call that the M operator. And the basic law, another way of stating the basic law is that systems can only be in eigenstates of the M operator. Now, I'll, I'll talk about a couple of different versions later in the talk, an absolute version that strictly says systems can only be in eigenstates of the M operator, and then a more approximate version that says that systems must uh, approximate eigenstates of the M operator. They just need to be close enough, but uh, we'll come to that in a moment. Okay, then with this in play, we can analyze this notion of measurement. We can say that a measurement occurs when an interaction enacts this law. Okay, so just to bring out this basic law of M properties a bit more carefully, we can go back to the example that I talked about before. Okay, so we've got this basic law of M properties that I want to illustrate. M properties refuse superposition. They respond via Born rule with collapse and thereby collapse everything that they're entangled with. So to illustrate this with our example, where we've got our particle starting out at position X and then entering into a superposition of being both here and there, we um, have our measuring device again. So our measuring device once again is set up to display an H on the screen. If it finds the particle here, it's, it'll display a T on the screen if it finds the particle there. But in addition, this measuring device possesses an M property. So at the moment, I've represented the value of the M property, which the measuring device currently possesses as M0. So we can say that M0 is correlated with the screen being ready, and we can say that there are other values of the M property that this measuring device can possess. Uh, it can possess the value M1 if uh, the screen uh, represents an H. It can possess the uh, M property M2 if the screen displays a T. So this is how it's set up. So now what happens according to Schrodinger evolution? According to Schrodinger evolution, uh, again, the superposition in the particle will magnify up into the measuring device, and insofar as the measuring device enters into a superposition of displaying an H and displaying a T on the screen, it will also enter into an M property superposition. So now it's in a superposition of these two values of the M property, M1 and M2. Now, if you want to make this a little bit more concrete, you can take consciousness to be the M property, that is where this talk is going. So you could think of M0, M1, M2 as specific conscious experiences, but at the moment, uh, M property theory is more general than the consciousness causes collapse hypothesis. The M property could be anything. Uh, indeed, maybe the M property is something we don't currently have a concept for and that we'll discover later on. So M property theory need not be specifically tied to consciousness. Uh, okay. So given the basic law of M properties, this state is either disallowed or is at the very least unstable and is going to trigger a collapse. And so we're going to get an indeterministic collapse in accordance with the Born rule, either to the H state, which puts the M property into state M1, or to the T state, the there state, in which case the device collapses to uh, the definite state M2, uh, again happening with Born rule probabilities. Okay, so that's the basic idea behind M property theory. Now, that's um, just a kind of a step by step process of how M property theory works. But is there any way of devising a coherent dynamics that gives us an assurance that uh, this kind of evolution makes sense at every point in time? And so here we need to distinguish two types of M property theory. So we can have a theory about absolute M properties. So an absolute M property is a property that just simply cannot go into a superposition at all. 
In other words, physical systems must stay in eigenstates of the M operator. They cannot be in superpositions of that operator at all. Uh, the other version is uh, what we'll call approximate M properties. And here the idea is that um, uh, systems are allowed to enter into superpositions of uh, the M operator, but uh, in some sense, uh, not for long or only subtle superpositions. Those kinds of superpositions would be unstable. So that would be an approximate M property theory. The attraction of the absolute M properties is, it seems like there's no new physics required. You don't have to add anything complicated to the theory beyond what you already have in textbook quantum mechanics. Because here, <clears throat> uh, the dynamics of the theory would be the dynamics of strong continuous measurement. Uh, which is the dynamics that would obtain on a traditional measurement collapse interpretation if the M property were being continuously strongly measured by an outside observer. So here the idea is you imagine that uh, the M property or the M observable is being continuously measured and that's what's keeping it in the eigenstate. That's, what keep it, that's what's keeping systems in eigenstates of the M operator. Now, we think that this version of the theory can't work because of what's called the quantum Zeno effect. So if you continuously measure a system in a given basis, you freeze the system in a definite value of that basis. So if you continuously strongly measure the position of a particle, you basically freeze it, you keep it in that position. That's the quantum Zeno effect. And that looks like a fairly bad consequence for this theory. So if we take consciousness to be the M property, then according to the absolute theory, it's as if consciousness is being continuously strongly measured by an outside observer. Or another way to put it, it's as if consciousness itself is continuously strongly measuring the physical correlates of consciousness. But the consequence of that would be that the state of consciousness that we're in couldn't change. And so we'd just freeze in a given conscious experience. Uh, but that looks uh, empirically inadequate. Clearly, we have a stream of consciousness that changes all the time. So if we're going to make a theory like this work, we need to appeal uh, to approximate M properties. Here we will need uh, new physics uh, because we need to make sense of this idea that M property superpositions are allowed but unstable. And we need to somehow describe this instability. Um, but we think that that's possible to do by adopting existing dynamics that you get in the literature on dynamical collapse theories, uh, in particular from the likes of Philip Pearl, Girardi, Romini and Weber, Roger Penrose, and so forth. Okay, so how that is going to work, I'll come back to uh, towards the end of the talk. What I'll do now is consider the possibility that consciousness could be an M property. This is going to be the way of uh, making sense of the consciousness causes collapse hypothesis. Okay, so this hypothesis that consciousness causes collapse has a, a history behind it. As I mentioned, the most, most famous discussion comes from Eugene Wigner's 1961 article, Remarks on the Mind Body Question. Uh, so he says in this article that being with a consciousness must have a different role in quantum mechanics than the inanimate measuring device. Uh, but you can, uh, as mentioned, find earlier statements going back seemingly as early as uh, London and Bauer. Okay, so why consider this hypothesis in the first place? Why take it seriously? Uh, is there any reason to uh, think that it could be true? So we think there's roughly five motivations that you could give for this hypothesis. Uh, so the first is conceptual. So we've got this uh, uh, textbook quantum mechanics, this framework that's uh, used rather successfully to predict the outcomes of measurement and so forth. Um, we've got the measurement problem. So the textbook quantum mechanics faces the measurement problem. This looks like just a straightforward way of analyzing the notion of measurement. So measurement seems imprecise. Well, the notion of conscious observation seems conceptually closely connected to the notion of measurement. So why not just replace measurement with the notion of constant conscious observation and be done with it then you're not making too many changes to the textbook formulation of quantum mechanics second motivation is uh, i guess epistemological so this theory is going to save what is arguably the central determinate measurement datum that we never experience superposed states 
So another way of uh, introducing the measurement problem is by saying, well, the Schrodinger equation is the fundamental law of nature in quantum mechanics, but it leads to things that we just don't seem to experience. It seems to lead to superpositions of conscious experience. It's a fundamental datum that we don't enter into experience superpositions, and so we need to somehow capture that. Now, more mainstream dynamical collapse theories treat the central datum uh, as measurement devices and other macroscopic systems never enter into superpositions, and they try and build a theory around that being the central datum. Um, but I think, strictly speaking, it's the fact that our experiences don't superpose that would be the central datum motivating collapse theories. Um, our experience is seemingly consistent with measuring devices being in superpositions. And so the con consciousness causes collapse hypothesis is going to capture that. The third is explanatory. So arguably, uh, at least within the M-property framework, we get some sort of an explanation for why collapse occurs. So why are wave functions collapsing at certain moments? Why do they collapse when they do? Well, if you think that there are these properties in nature, these M properties that through fundamental law just don't superpose, that's just how they, that's just how they are, um, then you might expect something like a collapse to occur. So if certain properties just cannot superpose, then you might expect that there must be something like a collapse of the wave function. And so if that's right, then you might think that consciousness as an M property explains why collapse occurs. Now, it's not going to explain why collapses uh, happen with certain probabilities. So it's not going to explain the Born rule. However, arguably, you can give an independent explanation of that. So uh, in collaborative work with Lev Weidman, uh, we've given proofs of the Born rule both in the many worlds interpretation and in collapse theories in general. Uh, so for example, in the paper, we give a proof of the Born rule within the context of just textbook measurement collapse interpretations. Uh, so here we derive the Born rule from principles of uh, symmetry and uh, a principle of no signaling. And so it seems that we could sort of adopt those independent principles to explain why collapse happens with certain probability. Why collapse happens at all? Arguably, uh, that could be explained by the existence of M properties. Uh, fourth motivation is metaphysical. Arguments for property dualism motivate the view. Now, if you're not sympathetic with property dualism, you're not going to find uh, this too convincing. Uh, however, if you're at all convinced by the arguments of my co-author, especially in his book, uh, The Conscious Mind from 1996, then uh, you could use those to motivate this theory. Uh, the idea being, if, con if we've already got arguments for consciousness being fundamental, then the consciousness causes collapse hypothesis offers perhaps what is the most straightforward way of connecting up consciousness with fundamental physics. Fifth motivation is causal. So at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned the consciousness causation problem. The problem that we don't really know what physical effects consciousness has, and this is central to the mind-body problem, we don't really know what consciousness does. Well, uh, the conscious causes collapse hypothesis at least gives us a proposal. It gives us a proposed causal role uh, for consciousness in the physical world. It tells us that the causal role of consciousness is to collapse the quantum mechanical wave function. Now, um, I think by themselves, maybe those aren't two convincing reasons to accept the theory, although perhaps in conjunction, all five of them together give some motivation for taking the, uh, the theory seriously. They certainly don't prove that the theory is true, but I think they give us some reason for considering it or taking seriously this interpretation. <clears throat> okay, so those are the pros. What about the cons? What are the reasons against the consciousness causes collapse hypothesis? Well, first we can consider uh, reasons against just the very idea of collapse. So there are objections in the literature against just the idea of collapse, never mind whether it's induced by consciousness or not. <clears throat> so there's problems with getting a Lorentz invariant formulation of the theory, uh, just general problems with getting consistency with special relativity, uh, which uh, Tim Maudlin has a very nice discussion of um, in his 2011 book. Um, there's also the tails problem, uh, the problem that um, typically in dynamical collapse theories, uh, collapses don't completely remove superpositions. There are tails left behind. Um, so I've argued that this is a, a fairly serious problem 
in other work. Uh, so in this paper, I'm not going to consider these kinds of problems. Uh, they are serious problems. Um, but I want to focus on problems that might be specific to the consciousness causes collapse idea. After all, one of the goals here is just to see if the consciousness causes collapse hypothesis can be put at the same level of rigor as existing interpretations. So if we can uh, sort of argue for the consciousness causes collapse interpretation such that the only remaining problems are problems that are problems for uh, collapse theories in general, then uh, the goal will be achieved. So I'm not going to consider these problems in this talk. Uh, so what are the main objections to the consciousness causes collapse interpretation? After all, it's a fairly unpopular theory. It's quickly dismissed uh, in textbooks on quantum mechanics. If you look to the literature, the main objection is, again, a precision objection, that just the notion of consciousness is not very precise. Uh, and this objection is put, by, uh, put very sharply um, in an excellent textbook by David Albert called Quantum Mechanics and Experience. So David Albert puts the problem as follows. But the trouble here is pretty obvious too. What this theory predicts, that, that is what theory it is, will hinge on the precise meaning of the word conscious. And that word simply doesn't have any absolutely precise meaning in ordinary language. And Wigner um, didn't make any attempt to make up a meaning for it. And so all this doesn't end up amounting to a genuine physical theory either. <clears throat> so Albert has just considered the standard von Neumann measurement collapse interpretation. He's discussed the measurement problem. This notion of measurement is too imprecise, doesn't give us a genuine physical theory. And then the thought is, well, hey, why don't we replace measurement with consciousness? And then Albert says, well, that's no help. Consciousness is no better than measurement. Arguably, it's even worse. So it's not an, it's not an improvement. It, it gives us no advantage, therefore doesn't solve the measurement problem. Now, we think that this objection can be responded to. Um, we think it's not so hard to make the notion of consciousness precise. Um, so David Albert is absolutely right that in ordinary language, there's no precise meaning uh, for the word consciousness. But in philosophy, uh, philosophers have made distinctions between different types of consciousness. For example, the distinction between access consciousness and phenomenal consciousness. So phenomenal consciousness is the important one for uh, this talk, whereby a system is phenomenally conscious if and only if there's something it is like to be that system, or a physical state, like a mental state, is conscious if and only if there's something it's like to be in that state. So that is a, a more precise notion of consciousness that comes from philosophy, but we also have more precise notions that come from neuroscience. In particular, in the last decade or so, we've seen the rise in neuroscience of mathematical theories of consciousness, the most prominent version being the integrated information theory. And so I think that we can use the integrated information theory to answer this objection. <clears throat> now, I just want to um, say before I explain the integrated information theory that it's just an example. Uh, integrated information theory is new. It's constantly being developed. Um, it helps us answer this objection, but um, it's just a sort of a, a proof of concept that you can make uh, the notion of consciousness precise. Okay, so the integrated information theory. Uh, I'm going to uh, just give a brief introduction to this theory, and the way I'm going to introduce it is in terms of one of the pieces of evidence that is used, as, that is used to support it. So uh, we've got two different parts of the brain depicted here. We've got the cerebrum and the cerebellum. So let's just talk about some facts about these two different areas of the brain. Starting with the cerebellum, cerebellum is very complicated, at least in terms of the number of neurons that composes it, uh, something in the order of 69 billion neurons in the cerebellum. However, they're not very integrated. They're not very interconnected. So you can probe one region of the cerebellum and you won't really affect neurons in other regions of, of the cerebellum very much. So that's what's meant by not very interconnected or not very integrated. It's also not conscious, so you can remove it without having much eff effects on your stream of consciousness. The cerebrum, on the other hand, is uh, relatively less complex, at least in terms of number of neurons, only about 16 billion neurons in the cerebrum. However, the neurons in the cerebrum are highly integrated or highly interconnected. Probe one region of the cerebrum and very likely you will affect neurons in other regions of the cerebrum. 
It's also the neural correlate of consciousness. Okay, so the physical basis of consciousness is to be found within a hotspot of um, a high level of interconnectivity within the cerebrum. And so this is uh, just one way of uh, uh, introducing integrated information theory. This data seems to suggest that interconnectivity or integration within uh, uh, nodes, such as neurons, seems crucial to consciousness. And so integrated information theory takes interconnectivity or integration as the basis of a theory, at least of the physical correlates of consciousness. And so there are three key notions that integrated information theory defines in order to, in order to define a, a, a measure of consciousness and a theory of consciousness based on uh, this interconnectivity. The first notion is a notion of information. So the specific notion of information here, at least roughly, is a measure of the extent to which a system's present state constrains its possible future and past states. Um, in other words, to what extent is a present state of, say, a neural network predictive of its uh, future state or its past state? That's uh, a notion of information about itself, self-information, information about its own future and past. Um, the next notion is integrated information, or phi. Uh, so phi is a measure of the extent to which a system's information is irreducible to the sum of the information in its parts. And this is a notion that connects to consciousness. Integrated information here quantifies the amount of consciousness in a physical system. Um, so it's not clear whether we have a notion, a pre-theoretical notion of amount of consciousness, but you might think that uh, your amount of consciousness goes down when you fall asleep. And the idea is that phi measures amount of consciousness. Finally, uh, there's what I call Q-shape. Um, so this has gone under different names in the literature. Uh, most recently, the advocates of IIT refer to it as maximally irreducible conceptual structure, which I think is a bit of a mouthful, so I've worked with the simpler notion of a Q-shape. So what's a Q-shape? Um, I basically think about it as the meriological structure or the part-whole structure of integrated information. Um, so it's an abstract structural property that represents how the system's components contributes to its phi. And according to integrated information theory, it is the Q shape of these large phi states in the cerebrum that determines the qualitative character or the qualia of our conscious experience. Okay, so that's, those are the three basic notions of integrated information theory. And so with that in play, we can think about using these notions to define more precise M properties. So you could think of using phi, integrated information, as your M property. That would mean that systems can't enter into superpositions of different phi values. Um, another theory would be to use this more complex notion of a Q shape. So here systems can't enter into superpositions of different Q shapes. So theory one, um, it would be nice if we could work with it because it would be a little bit simpler, uh, but there seems to be a fatal problem, which is it fails to suppress superpositions of qualitatively distinct equal phi conscious states. So in other words, uh, I mentioned that your level of phi goes down when you fall asleep, but when you're awake and your experiences are changing, um, you have different experiences but there's not much reason to think that there's different phi in those experiments, experiences. Um, what that means is you could enter into a superposition of different experiences, but those different experiences have equal phi. This M property theory would, would just not collapse them because you don't have a superposition of phi. You only have a superposition of the qualitative character in your experience. Um, and that seems like a bad problem. Uh, recall that the uh, key datum that we're trying to capture here is that our experiences, especially their qualitative character, don't superpose. So it doesn't look like that version of the theory will work. And so we'll have to work with Q-shape. Um, I don't think that has the problem that uh, befalls the uh, phi theory. Um, but the big issue here is just going to be how do we actually define a Q-shape operator? Um, now, this is also a problem for the uh, theory one as well. How do we define a phi operator is also uh, far from trivial. 
Um, so what I'll do now is I'll just try and give a, a little bit of a starting point in how we might go about defining a, a Q-shape operator. And um, I'll use a what's hopefully going to be a simple example of Schrodinger's cat. Um, so this isn't too much different from the previous example where we magnified uh, a, a superposition of a particle up to a macroscopic system. It's just that in this case, the macroscopic system is not a measuring device, it's a, it's a cat. Um, but we can take the, uh, the aliveness of the cat as being indicative of the state of the particle. So uh, Schrodinger's cat enters into a superposition of alive and dead. Presumably, that's going to be a superposition of different experiences because the dead cat's not going to have an experience. The alive cat will. And so we want to represent the quantum state of the cat's cerebrum. Um, and it's you know, going to look something like this. So we've got the superposition of alive and dead. And then we've got a superposition of phi. So corresponding to the dead state, I've got phi equals zero because it's not conscious at all. Uh, and then uh, on the alive state, I've got phi equals two. Now, realistically, a cat's going to have much more phi than that, but we're going to uh, simplify things. Okay, so corresponding to those two brain states, we've also got two, uh, two different Q shapes. Um, we've got Q0 perhaps as the null state. There's no Q shape because there's no phi. And then we'll just label Q1 as the Q shape corresponding to uh, the neural network in the cerebrum of the cat. And so we can at least very simply represent um, the cerebrum of the cat with just two neurons. So just to idealize, um, we can just say, well, there's just two neurons in the cat's brain neuron A and neuron B, and the connections between them is very simplistic. So copy here just means that they copy each other's state. So A here is represented as being on, and so in the next moment, it will turn B on. B is off, so in the next moment, it will turn A on. And so the effect is that they basically swap. So in the next moment, the, so the current state is one, zero, uh, one being on, zero being off. So in the next moment, it's gonna be zero, one. And so that's the interaction uh, between these two neurons. Um, so this is an example that I've tried to analyze in detail in order to illustrate in a very simple example, the IIT formalism uh, in my paper, uh, Illusionist Integrated Information Theory, uh, which you can find on my website if you wanna look into this in more detail. Um, but I think we can use this very simple two neuron example just to illustrate what we want here. So we want to make sense of uh, say a quantum state like this, where we're representing the quantum state of the cat cerebrum, which contains just these two neurons. So we can represent the dead state where the uh, connection is cut, um, for example. Okay, and so we wanna be able to do this so that we can uh, work out whether the state is allowed by the n-property theory or at the very least is unstable. And so how do we go about doing this? In particular, where did we get phi equals two? Uh, once we get phi equals two, we can talk about how the components contribute to that value and therefore define a Q shape out of that. But before we get the Q shape, how do we get the phi? Okay, so I've got a, a couple of equa equations here. Um, first, the equation for information and then the equation for integration. Um, so let's just talk about the equation for information. So uh, the information contained in AB, this is going to be the information about its future state. I'm gonna forget about past, again, just to make this a little bit simpler. So the information contained in uh, the state um, it's given by this formula log two four minus log two one. So where does the four come from? Where does the one come from? Uh, you can kind of ignore the log two, that's just to put these values uh, into uh, units of information. Um, the crucial values here are four and one. Well, there's four possible states of the system. Like if you don't know what its current state is, its current state is one zero, but if you don't know what its current state is, and then there's four possible states that it could be in. Uh, on, off, off, on, off, off, and on, on. So that's where the four comes from. Um, now imagine that you do know what its current state is. So you know that it's one zero. You can then determine that there's only one possible future state consistent with the present state. So remember the interconnection is such that these are just gonna swap at each moment. So the next state must be zero one given that its current state is one zero. And so this is information. It's a measure of the extent to which the current state of the system constrains the future state of the system. And so we measure that and that comes out as two. So on the right hand side, I've got the formula for uh, uh, integrated information as well, which is um, um, uh, the integrated information is basically uh, the information in the whole minus the sum of the information of the parts. 
which comes to two. So all of the information in this particular example happens to be integrated. Okay, I should mention this formalism is often referred to as IAT 2.0. Um, what you'll see in recent papers is a much more uh, detailed and general formalism, which I think it was just too complicated to present here, called IAT 3.0. Advocates of this theory are now working on IAT 4.0, but this will be sufficient to uh, illustrate what we want. Um, I think if we get an information operator going, then the phi operator and the Q-shape operator will just follow relatively straightforwardly. The challenge is going to be, how do we get an information operator going? And so the thought is, uh, for the cat cerebrum as our example, we need to first expand uh, the quantum state of the cat cerebrum in something like a position basis, so that we can have for example, our two neurons represented in their current state. But now we need to work out how do we make sense of this idea of consistency, which future states are consistent with the present state. And here I think we need to apply appropriate classical laws to each basis vector in the superposition to determine what future states are consistent with the present states. And so here the appropriate classical laws in our example will be the laws that dictate the swapping of the two uh, states of the neurons. Okay, again, just a, a starting point, but supposed to be just proof of concept. It's obviously going to get fairly complicated, especially when we try and implement this in more general versions of IAT. Um, but hopefully that's convinced you that there's at least a, a way of uh, formulating this in principle. Okay, so that's the consciousness part. Now, can we actually come up with dynamics, uh, any clear dynamics for this? So earlier I mentioned the quantum Zeno problem. And that this is a problem for the absolute M property theory. Um, and so I'll start by illustrating how this uh, really is a problem and how this then motivates us to move towards the approximate M property theory. So I'll, um, we can introduce this problem by asking the question, how is it possible to wake up according to this theory? So this is going to be equivalent to evolving from the state in which you are phi equals zero to the state in which you are phi equals one. So we can uh, represent that here. So along the bottom, we've got the starting state, phi equals zero. And then how do we move to the state along on the right-hand side, phi equals one? And so uh, I've, depict, I've got a geometrical representation of that. We've um, uh, got a vector space where the basis vectors are definite states of phi. And we've got our state vector sitting on the phi equals zero state. And we want the state vector to move to the phi equals one state, which is basically representing the starting point of waking up. Um, but continuous Schrodinger evolution doesn't jump from one eigenstate to the next. In order to get from phi equals zero to phi equals one, according to Schrodinger evolution, the system's got to move through superpositions of those two states. And so in the middle here, we've got the middle state where the state vector is 45 degrees to these two basis vectors, uh, phi equals zero and phi equals one. And so that re represents the system being in an equally weighted superposition of phi equals zero and phi equals one. Now, working with the absolute M property theory, recall according to this theory, it's as if the phi in this case is being continuously measured by an outside observer. But what does that mean? So um, we're at phi equals zero, Schrodinger evolution is trying to push the state vector down to the phi equals one basis, but that's going to be a superposition. Um, and so we're going to get a collapse given that it's as if the phi of the system is being continuously measured. Now, if the state vector is able to get to 45 degrees as depicted in the middle here, then it's got a 50% chance of collapsing to the phi equals one state. But um, we're never going to get there because the basic problem is that if we consider an initial superposition created by the continuous Schrodinger state vector rotation, then uh, the probability that we get a collapse back to the phi equals zero state is going to be overwhelmingly high. And so that's basically the quantum Zeno effect applied to phi. And so that's why it seems like the uh, absolute M property theory is going to be impossible to implement. And so what we need ultimately is a theory that allows a little bit of a superposition. It allows the state vector to evolve forward, say, a little bit. If that's what happens, then not with overwhelming probability, but with high probability, the state vector will collapse back again to the phi equals zero state. But insofar as there are forces within you trying to wake you up, 
then the state vector will start moving again. Probably it collapses back to phi equals zero. But as long as there's some non-negligible probability that it can collapse to the phi equals one state, then eventually it will collapse to the phi equals one state and you start waking up. Okay, so that's why we need the approximate M property theory. And now the question is, how could we ever make sense of that? Can there be rigorous dynamics um, that represent this? And I think here we can make use of existing dynamical collapse theories. So Roger Penrose has a dynamical collapse theory and it looks an awful lot like an M property theory. I'm not really sure if Penrose would agree that uh, this is an instance of an M property theory, but Penrose's theory looks like a theory according to which the M property is space-time curvature. Uh, because in his theory, um, uh, superpositions of different space-time metrics are unstable, kind of like a, an M property. Um, and so you can't have systems that evolve into superpositions of uh, different space-time curvatures or different space-time metrics. And so in order to make sense of the approximate um, uh, or the instability of these superpositions, uh, Roger Penrose gives us a, a time scale in which you can expect a collapse to happen. T equals uh, h bar on E, where E is the uh, difference in uh, the gravitational energy of um, the two states of the superposition. So roughly just how different is the, is the space-time curvature in the two states of the superposition. Okay, so we could use that as our model and try and adapt something similar. And so if we're taking our M property to be Q-shape, and we want to make sense of this idea that Q-shape superpositions are not impossible, but are just unstable, then we could perhaps come up with a similar kind of time scale. T equals C, I mean, C is just a constant here. We could use H-bar, but it'd be presumably some empirically bounded constant. C over Q, where Q is going to be the distance in Q space. So here we need a measure of distance or difference between Q shapes. And that's gonna to correspond to a measure of how different the qualitative character of two experiences are. And fortunately, the IIT people are all over this. They've um, already provided a measure of distance in Q space, which is measured by what's called the earth movers distance, which is roughly a measure of, um, yeah, the amount of energy it would take to move one piece of dirt into uh, another region. You can think of it roughly as uh, the energy required to transform one Q shape into the other. Um, and so I've got a link here for anyone interested, which is um, basically a computer program where you can uh, uh, give it two uh, neural networks and it'll calculate the information, the phi, the Q shapes of both, and then it will give you a measure of the distance or the difference between the two Q shapes. And so the thought is we can use that um, to uh, give us a measure of the time scale in which collapse occurs. Okay, so that's uh, one way of perhaps making this more precise. Um, however, Penrose uh, sometimes comes across the criticism that he hasn't really provided uh, precise enough dynamics. He's just giving us this sort of time scale and when to expect collapse to occur. Um, in that case, we could move to what is uh, surely the most uh, well-developed and, and, and precise dynamical collapse theory that's been devised, and that comes from Philip Pearl's continuous spontaneous localization model. Uh, so Pearl's theory, I think you couldn't really describe it as an M property theory. Um, he's got uh, a new kind of field, a noise field that interacts with quantum systems, which is what triggers the collapse. So something rather different appears to be going on there. Um, Nonetheless, it seems that you can use some of the basic ideas that Pearl has come up with to formulate a more precise uh, M property theory where consciousness is the M property. So we've got a basis for collapse in Pearl's theory, which is basically mass density. So you can't have uh, super, or superpositions of different mass density distributions are unstable. Now, Pearl um, gives us a sort of an interesting way of thinking about the collapse rate. So if we just think of um, a superposition of two different mass density distributions, and he's giving us a kind of a way of thinking of um, how this superposition can just over time be suppressed and then removed eventually. And he gives us equations for how fast this happens. And so he has this very interesting idea where just intuitively he imagines two gamblers they start out with $100, so say they have $50 each, and then they flip a fair coin, and whoever wins gets a dollar from the other person, and then they keep playing, they keep flipping the coin, 
And then eventually, after enough time, someone wins and they get 100%. They get $100 and the other person gets $0. And that's going to be analogous to a collapse where a given state in the superposition acquires 100% of the squared amplitude. And so Perl now imagines that you have uh, the two uh, components of the superposition effectively playing uh, this, this gambler's ruin game, as it's called, with infinitesimal amounts of their squared amplitudes. So rather than $100, you have um, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the amplitudes distributed um, among the uh, um, components of the superposition. And they, they're, they're basically swapping or gambling, so to speak, infinitesimal amounts of their amplitude. And then the question is, how fast does this happen? What is the rate at which they play this game, so to speak? And so Pearl provides um, an experimentally bounded constant, lambda, as partly what determines this rate. It's also going to be the product of their amplitudes um, that's going to determine this weight, rate. So that means if it's an equally weighted superposition, then this is going to happen faster. It's then going to slow down as um, the uh, amplitudes are not as equally weighted. So if we go back to our superposition of phi equals zero and phi equals one, um, that's going to mean that the initial superposition where most of the amplitude is attributed to the phi equals zero state is a superposition where this slow collapse process is happening quite slowly. And so that's going to get us around the quantum Zeno effect problem. Uh, and then in addition, it's the square of their mass density difference. So how different these mass density distributions are in the superposition. Okay, so that's going to uh, be suggestive um, um, for our theory here where the collapse basis is Q-shape. And so perhaps something similar can be formulated where the collapse rate is determined in the same way by some experimentally bounded constant. Again, the product of their amplitudes and the distance in Q-space um, discussed before. Okay, so if all this is right, then we've at the very least got the resources to construct a precise version of the consciousness causes collapse hypothesis. And we can at least begin uh, considering possible ways of experimentally testing this theory. And so I'll finish uh, the discussion here with the discussion of possible experiments. Um, so how could this happen? Well, first of all, you have interferometer experiments. Um, so perhaps we could, in the future, with uh, better technology, create two simple physical systems, S1 and S2, similar in all respects, as similar as we can get them, except that the phi of S1 is much greater than the phi of S2. That should guarantee that their Q shapes are quite different. Uh, and then try to show that only uh, S2 type systems are capable of yielding interference effects. Um, this is going to obviously be rather difficult to do, but uh, maybe there's some way of doing this. Um, you can perhaps imagine a double slit experiment where you send them uh, through uh, systems of type S1 compared with systems of type S2, and uh, maybe the uh, low phi systems give interference effects, the S2 systems do not. Uh, finally, um, if you look at the literature in dynamical collapse theories, collapse tends to violate energy conservation. Um, and this is discussed in an interesting paper by Feldman and Tomolka, um, where you should expect um, very subtle, spontaneous uh, heat and sound emissions. Um, now, insofar as we're saying it's the large phi systems that cause collapse, and the collapses are greater for the large phi systems, then um, the suggestion here would be to look to these large phi systems and to look to see if there's any of these subtle, spontaneous heat or sound emissions. Maybe there's some way of experimentally testing that in the future. Um, but obviously, this is all very speculative, but hopefully I've uh, given you reason to think that, uh, at least in principle, the consciousness causes collapse hypothesis can be made at least as rigorous as other existing collapse theories. And I'll finish there. Thanks very much for watching.